Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, 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 g'day, curd nerds. Welcome to another Ask the Cheese Man where you can learn about all things home cheese making. I just didn't make that up. Anyway, <laughs> it's great to see all you here. Um, so far, we've got 48 watching, which is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, lots of hellos to say. First up, simply on the chat, we've got Fishy Fish, Henri, Wilmer and Charles, uh, Manel, Andrew, Gassan, Spartan, Louis, David, Paul, April, Patricia, Mr. Borbag, Esther, uh, Silvers, John, Deep South Texas, Nassi, uh, David, again, Joy, and Jeff, Jeff, who's a member. Fantastic. Thank you, Jeff, for your ongoing um, membership, patronage, and all that sort of stuff. And Kim's here too, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping. I'd like to say a warm hello and welcome to two new members to the channel this week, uh, Marianne Miller and Stefan Rusek. Uh, thank you very much for your ongoing membership to the channel. If you want to become a member of the channel, don't forget there's a join button down there somewhere underneath the video, probably, maybe. Uh, and that's how you can join and you get some perks and um, some cool stuff there. And early access to uh, the making videos. So the, the actual video tutorials on how to make a cheese, uh, you get early access to that as well as um, some cool icons and all that sort of good stuff. Uh, a few more just came on board. Helmet, Rachel, King, Borhog, Ritesh and Oscar. Okay, there is a um, question that uh, we've seen, and it's been answered kind of in the chat already. Uh, Gassan says, Sir, if I have fresh milk from a cow, do I need to boil it first? Uh, no, and it's already been answered. Uh, you don't boil the milk before you make cheese. The only milk, sorry, the only cheese that you boil the milk for first is uh, paneer. Uh, and that's the traditional recipe for that. Boiling the milk denatures and destroys the proteins and the casein. Uh, so when you try and add in rennet, you'll find that it doesn't work. It won't set a curd at all. It's like using UHT milk. You might as well use that, which doesn't work either. Uh, so there is a video to, uh, about the best types of milk to use. Um, and, uh, uh, hopefully Kim can find that uh, quickly and pop that up into the uh, the chat box. Okay, uh, Paul's got a question and Paul said, I've made goat milk brie and that was awesome. I'm going to make brie with cow's milk. How much lipase would you recommend for a 10 litre batch? Do you think it would give a similar flavour? Yeah, adding some lipase will work. Um, I would use an eighth of a teaspoon for a 10 litre batch. Make sure, though, that you rehydrate the light, the lipase in quarter of a cup of, uh, of, of non-chlorinated water first, uh, and then uh, wait 15 minutes so it's fully rehydrated, and then um, uh, throw that into the milk uh, before the calcium chloride needs to go in before. So you can add at the same time you add your starter cultures, um, so, yeah, and hopefully that'll all work out for you. Um, hello, Max. Hello, a Angel. Um, Chris B says, Hi, Gavin. Can I reuse old cheese wax? And if so, what is the procedure? Yes, you certainly can use old cheese wax. Um, just make sure if it's off, off of commercial cheeses, you'll find they've got a little layer of clear layer of PVA uh, coating that may be inside the wax, so pull that off first. If it's your own wax, all you have to do is just wash uh, the, the wax. It sounds a bit weird, but just wash off the cheesy bits uh, that may be stuck on the wax. 
just so that's nice and clean. And then just pat that dry with a paper towel and then pop it into your wax pot and melt it the next time round. So nice and easy. Just make sure it's nice and clean. Because we're going to bring the temperature of the wax up when we use it to about 75 degrees Celsius, it's going to kill any pathogens anyway. So there you go, Chris. That's how you do it. Um, uh, Manel says, what are the difference, differences between the cultures in your website and other companies? Can I follow up your cheese recipes? Can I follow up your cheese recipes when I buy cultures from other companies? Yeah, there are. There are fairly interchangeable. I actually did a video about starter cultures and the basic types. Really, all you have to do is look for the different bacteria types. Um, so, so the different types of bacteria for the different types of cheese. Thanks, Fishy Fish. I appreciate that. Cheese is great. It is indeed. So the different bacteria types. So, Kim, if you can just find the video around uh, the different types of starter cultures. Uh, I'd be grateful and pop that up there. Um, and that would answer uh, Manal's question. Uh, so between different shops and they'll have different types of cultures from different types of companies, there's no uh, similar similar nomenclature for the different types of cultures. So they're not, there's not a standard. The only standard is the bacteria types or the bacteria strains that you have in the cheese. Okay. Um, Bobsy, oh, hey Gavin, looking forward to my feta on Friday. Nice one, Bob, and thanks for sending us um, through that that information before. Um, April, speaking of boiling milk, I can only find UHT milk where I live. Can I still use a cup, uh, 250 mils, to add fat to cheese or UHT cream? Oh, cream, not milk. Uh, simply float away in the way. Uh, yeah, it will. It won't uh, incorporate into the milk and you um, you won't be able to get a decent curd set. So please don't use UHT cream. Um, like, like I say most times, try and find a farmer who will be willing to give you um, milk. Okay, uh, Dongle5 says, Hi Gavin, I made your kefili for the first time yesterday and it looks good. Well, hopefully it will turn out. Okay, Nassie says, Le King de Fromage. Uh, would that be me or you? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, where are we up to now? Right. A Spartan says, have I, have I ever made Manchego cheese before? If not, please do. Yes, I have. Gee, we're keeping Kim busy today. Um, there, Kim, if you can find the link on YouTube for my Manchego cheese. Uh, I did cheat a little bit. Normal Manchego is used uses the milk from Manchego sheep. So I use cow's milk and I added um, some lipase to give a similar flavour. It wasn't the same uh, texture or flavour in um, than that sheep's milk would give you, as I've recently found out with my uh, Pecorino Romano. Uh, but uh, it was passable, tasted very nice. Um, but if you can't get your hands on sheep milk, check out the the uh, the cow's milk video that I made. Okay. Um, uh, next question is from Jake. Um, I'm making culture butter and open my jar before shaking it. Will that mess up the batch? No, it won't. It won't mess it up at all. Um, just make sure you don't overshake it. And I've learnt this lesson twice, twice, two times. Once you start seeing the fat separate from the liquid, the liquid's the buttermilk, and yet that's cultured buttermilk, which you can use as a mesophilic starter for other cheeses, which is pretty cool. Uh, as soon as it starts to separate, then I would recommend don't shake too much longer. And I'm talking no more than 30 seconds and then just strain out your butter and your buttermilk, just like I did. Um, Esther said, so I've never made cheese before, but I really want to try. Do you recommend any beginner cheeses um, that I can start with? Yeah, definitely. My favourite beginner cheese of late is halloumi. I don't know if um, anybody's, well, I dare say some people out there who are watching have uh, seen halloumi and seen the um, 
the halloumi videos that I've done. Uh, it's a really simple cheese. You just need milk. You need some rennet, um, a little bit of calcium chloride, I think, as well. Uh, and basically, you make a, a very basic curd. Um, you press it lightly with just two, um, two, what are they called? Cheese boards or um, uh, cutting boards. Um, and you press it with two kilos of weight, which is the same as a milk bottle full of water. Um, and then you boil up away to about 97 Fahrenheit, uh, not Fahrenheit, Celsius, and you put your chunks of curd about that that you've cut about that big, pop them in there, they'll all sink to the bottom. When they float to the top, they're done. And then you salt them and cover them in mint, which is absolutely lovely. Anyway, there's a recipe out there on the channel if you want to search for it. Um, halloumi is a great cheese to start with. And then fry it up in a frying pan. It's absolutely fantastic. Really, really good. Okay. Um, got a question from Wilma Charlie. Hi, Gavin. I noticed calcium chloride is not used in the Stilton recipe. Why isn't this required for this cheese? Sorry if it's a silly question, Anthony. No, it's not a silly question, Anthony. Um, I don't use it in that recipe because the fat content is so high, it doesn't really need it. It sets a curd very well. So that's the only reason you don't add it. And you can, if you're using pasteurized, homogenized milk, probably best to add a little bit. Um, so add in um, half, a, half a teaspoon uh, per 10 litres of milk. Okay. Um, uh, Aga says, uh, what, what did you work as before becoming, before becoming a full-time curd nerd? Um, what did I do before? I was in IT security in a governance role, uh, risk management and um, audit management. Very exciting stuff. Don't you worry about that. Uh, but I have recently retired uh, from that work and now I am a full-time uh, curd nerd and, uh, and small business owner with my lovely wife, Kim, who's uh, moderating the chat today. Okay, um, Oscar says, am I going to make another Q&A seven days from now? Indeed I am, um, health uh, allowing. So yes, I will do that. Um, and usually about an hour after this show finishes, I reschedule um, and update the show. So you, you'll be able to set a reminder if you need to. Okay, my voice is kind of going today. Anyway, uh, John, <coughs> John says, Gavin, I recently made some friends from Romania and I was wondering if you could make a cheese called Nassal. Um, it looks like a smeared rind type. Let me have a look. I'll go and hunt for a recipe for that, John. Uh, while we're on recipes, one thing I didn't talk about was the cheeses, the cheese videos that are coming up. So I'll just take a quick, quick break. Um, so this Friday... Australian time, Thursday, um, uh, North and South America time is Limburger. So that's coming out. Uh, and then on the following Monday or Tuesday, it'll be the Limburger taste test. And yes, I've tasted it already. Um, I'm doing post-production now for Caccio Cavallo, which is cheese on horseback. It's got a lot of different names, Cash Caval. Um, the, every language around that sort of area, around the Mediterranean, seem to have their own version of uh, 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 Caccio Cavallo. So it's two cheeses on string hung over something. It's made with um, pasta filata in the pasta filata style. So I managed to pull it off. So that'll be a good one. And today I'm making, um, after I give Kim a hand packing up some um, some orders to ship out, uh, some cream cheese so fingers crossed I've already tried it twice we'll video it again and hopefully I'll get a different recipe this time so we'll see what happens anyway so that's the recent uh, that's what's happening on video land um, all right back again <coughs> um, Maria says uh, hi Kevin who's Kevin um, what size would you what size mould would you get to get a cheddar Colby? Thanks. Um, I would use the 165 millimetre mould and basket, no, basket, 
uh, and follower that I've got on our website. And if Kim can find the link for that, that would be fantastic. Giving you a bit of work today, love. Um, Jeffrey says, I'm not able to get non-homogenized milk. Is there something I should do to my pasteurized homogenized milk to make it work with when making cheese? Yeah, indeed. Um, Jeffrey, just uh, calcium chloride is the answer to that. It adds back some soluble calcium back into the milk that was destroy, destroyed during pasteurization. However, because the milk's homogenized, um, the curd set, set may be a little bit less firmer, so you'll need to add just a little bit more rennet. And I'm only talking probably an eighth of a teaspoon more than I normally would. And that you'll get a good uh, curd set and uh, it'll all be good. Um, Isabella says, if you use spices, when should you add them into the cheese? Okay, so uh, I normally add spices like chilies or pepper, peppercorns or um, cumin or stuff like that. I add them when I mill the cheese. So just before I put the cheese into the, che the basket, before pressing, during that stage when I'm adding the salt, um, that's when I will add in the the spices to the to the cheese if I'm going to add spices at all. So, <clears throat> uh, Wayne, g'day, Wayne. How are you? Patricia says you say wrap some cheese in foil. Is it special foil or will regular aluminium foil work? Well, just I was waiting for that question. Here is some special foil. Now I'll get closer. I don't know if it's going to work. Is that focusing? Right, as you might see, it's got little holes, micro perforations. This is the best sort of foil to use for wrapping up, especially like blue cheeses, that sort of thing, which I, I do mention quite a bit. That's the best because it allows it to breathe and it can still grow a little bit of um, uh, grow a little bit of the mold while it's wrapped up. So it doesn't go crazy. The mould doesn't go crazy, but it, it's stifled a little bit by the silver wrap. So, yeah, we've got that available on our website, and so do most cheesemakers, cheesemaking suppliers. Um, it's a common product, uh, but it's uh, a lot better than tin foil or al aluminium foil. Uh, one, because it allows this stuff, allows the cheese to breathe, whereas aluminium foil doesn't. Um, anyway. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay, um, where am I up to? I am up to Patricia. Patricia says, hey, Gavin, do you have a video on your YouTube channel how to make full fat cream cheese like Philadelphia? If not, can you make one, please? I'm living in the Netherlands. We can't buy it here. Uh, yes, indeed, well, I do have a video. So Kim's going to kill me for this, but um, Kim, if you're listening, <coughs> Um, if you could find the cream cheese video and put the link up for Patricia uh, and it'll show you how to make a full-blown, full-fat cream cheese just like Philadelphia. Um, just beware, the longer you let the bag hang, the, the, the bag with the curds in it to drip, the sharper the, the flavour of the cream cheese will be. So just be careful around that. Okay, <clears throat> uh, Adam says, oh, I've lost everybody. No, there we go. Adam says, I just watched your video on the triple pepper jack cheese recipe. However, I was really curious to find the taste test. Could you find the link for me? Uh, Kim, <laughs> here's another one, honey. Uh, if you can find the link for um, uh, young Adam Lopez and pop that up there for the Taste test for the, oops, it's gone out of focus. The triple pepper jack. That will be good. Okay. Um, where am I up to? Uh, Mick says, when aging small cheese for longer maturation times, how do you determine when the rind development and moisture loss is right for vacuum packing? Uh, normally what I do, uh, Mick, is just um, give it a bit of a tap on the top. If it sounds a little bit, if it's got to be dry, obviously the rind's got to be dry, um, and you can hear by the sound that it doesn't sound dull. It sounds like you can knock on it, if that makes sense. 
So you get a decent rind then. It's usually about a centimetre. Um, and then you can vacuum pack it. That's the best way I determine it anyway. So it's like knocking on wood. Like that. Okay, King Warhog says, I'm currently maturing blue cheddar. Fantastic. Um, it seems fairly moist. Uh, lots of condensation in the box and moisture on the surface is this normal. I'm drying it up every few days. I'm just trying to think back to when I made mine. The first week or two, yes, that was certainly the case. Uh, but after about two weeks, um, no, there wasn't any more moisture in the box. There was no condensation on the lid or anything like that, and it seemed to come out okay. Uh, if you need to, what I would recommend, if you think it's too moist and it's past the two-week mark, then just uh, air dry it in the kitchen somewhere so it dries out again um, and then pop it back in the maturation box and and uh, and let it uh, evolve in there again and get its nice um, uh, blue coat all over it. Okay, Rachel says, uh, what's a good starter cheese to start with? Sorry, I'm sure you get this question a lot. In fact, I do, Rachel, and <laughs> we've already talked about it during the stream. So... Um, Halloumi, there should be a link somewhere. Oh, there is. Kim's already put it up. About four questions down. How to make halloumi. Check that one out. You'll be pleasantly surprised. Okay. Manal says, do you leave wax to cool before using it or directly using? Do you leave wax? Do you leave wax cool? Um, so when I dip in the cheese into the wax, so I make sure that the wax is 75 degrees Celsius, so it's fairly warm, and that kills off any bacteria or yeasts. So I'll get the cheese and I'll dip it in. Uh, sometimes if the cheese is n not very firm, if it's like a semi-hard cheese, I'll put it in the freezer <clears throat> for 10 minutes, and that cools the surface down. That as soon as you put the wax on, it instantly solidifies. So you can take that out again. So then... The wax is solid, so grab it by the wax part and then dunk that in. Or you can use a brush and then brush it all over and it looks a bit messy, but um, I find dunking it into a decent size wax bowl that you've uh, heated not directly but on a double boiler, um, that works the best. Hopefully that helps. Um, and King Borhog said uh, he started on cottage cheese, which is a good way to do it. Um... David says, do you ever get tired of answering the same questions um, episode after episode? No, I don't. I don't because it's all a learning thing. And we got a um, super chat from Jedi Fat. Fantastic. All right, here we go. Hi, Gavin. I'm aging a buttermilk blue. There seems to be more white and brown tan mold on the outside than blue. Uh, also, can I make... Oh, I think that's like coffee cheese from Finland. It's a Finnish breakfast cheese. Um, yes, I do have that on my list to make. Lipa Justo. Oh, I don't, I've, I've butchered that. But yeah, it's a bread cheese, I think it's called as well. Um, yeah, as for your buttermilk blue, uh, not sure. I've never made a buttermilk blue before. Uh, so the buttermilk... Culture is, uh, it's a aromatic mesophilic starter culture. So um, it's got two more lactic bacteria than normal mesophilic culture. If it's white and brown, I would wash it off, um, pierce it, and then hope for the best. I don't know. If you haven't got much blue on the outside, um, there's no way to actually start the blue again, except dry your container out a little bit because it seems that these brown and tan moulds on the outside of the cheese uh, will indeed uh, grow when there's more moisture than there should be. Blue mould seems to grow a lot better when uh, it's not as moist, so about 80% humidity, whereas um, white, red and brown and even black moulds tend to grow a lot better and faster around 90% humidity, so... Hopefully that answers your question. And I'll try the finished breakfast cheese out soon. Okay, back to the regular scheduled questions. Um, 
David. No, I've already said David. Um, Jason from NKY Homesteading. I'm about to make a grating cheese for pasta. What recipes were you most pleased with that you've done videos of? Okay, well, obviously Parmesan was a fantastic grating cheese. Now, if you want a quick grating cheese, um, um, uh, ricotta salada, uh, make sure it's well salted as well. So there's one I've done a video of. I use sheep's milk for that one, um, but it was the whey left over and there was a lot of protein in it. So I made another cheese, uh, ricotta salada. And that was a really good grating cheese. We, in fact, we still got some left. Um, and I just pull it out when we make pasta and just um, grate some over the top. Another fantastic one is um, Romano uh, Vaccio, which is cow's milk Romano. That's a nice, it's not quick, it takes 10 months to, for it to fully mature. Um, Another good one, Manchego, is great for grating. Double, there's a double grate there. So great for grating. So try that. Um, so that was cool. Uh, so there's a couple, three, four, four cheeses that you could use for grating and they'll taste absolutely fantastic. In fact, even the um, oh, Asadero Papato was another one that I did remember was a very good grating cheese as well. Okay, Steve Lemon said, I made halloumi on Sunday. It was awesome. Well done, Steve. Halloumi is a good one. Uh, nom, nom kababama, righto. Uh, is that cheese wheel on the cheese, is commercial really not mature yet? Is the cheese wheel on cheese it? No, don't understand the question. Sorry about that. Um, David says, when can we look forward to another behind the scenes cheese making with a family member or guest cheese maker? Well, um, I don't know. Um, I'll have to find one of my kids and rope them into another cheese video. Um, so yeah, it, uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But good question, David. Um, uh, Dwayne says, halloumi is a cheese that does not melt, melt if you fry it. That's indeed correct. Um, Halloumi and Kim's been deleting people and can't wait to watch one of these. I always watch at work. <laughs> nice one. Nice one, Dwayne. And Honoré said, uh, gracias por oh, I, something for my passion. Thank you. No, th thank you, Honoré. Uh, yes, Kim is removing the bad comments. She's done this and blocked, hopefully, Got rid of them. Thank you. Uh, Richard uh, says, is there any kind of cheese you haven't made because you're afraid of the complexity of it? Uh, well, there were a couple. Um, traditional mozzarella was one I was a bit frightened of, as was provolone. Um, so I managed to uh, get over my fear of those two and made them successfully. Uh, in fact, most of the... Uh, the pasta filata style cheeses, the stretch curd cheeses. Uh, Caccio Cavalli was, Cavallo was one that I was a bit uh, dubious about as well, but once I got into it, no problems. Once I got the curd stretched, that's the, the scariest bit is when you've used all that milk. I had to use, oh, I used 14 litres of milk, which is 14 quarts or three and a half gallons, three and a half gallons. Yeah, that'd be about right. Um, so I used all that milk and I didn't want to waste it. So thankfully it all worked out. That's the only thing I'm scared of is wasting the milk. Don't really want to. Um, Kim, you are a fantastic moderator. I really do appreciate your time in helping me uh, make these shows. Okay. Um, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne says, Lieben, I think it's how you spell it, is a yogurt cheese. I've made it before. It's a great substitute for cream cheese. I'll have a look. Probably the same as um, uh, Labner, which is a nice, simple yogurt cheese. Very nice. Great to flavour it with as well. Uh, uh, where are we up to? Uh, Michael, you're a bit late. Yes, you are. Xavier. Hi, Gavin. What's the best cheese? for two avid curd nerds to make. <laughs> oh, my Lord. There is no best cheese. Just pick one you like, pick a style you like, and give it a go, honestly. 
Yes, Kim found the triple pepper jack taste test. Well done there, darling. Um, I'm just catching up myself. Newbie here from Michael. I got some fresh milk from a neighbour's cow. Let the cream separate. Made a fantastic butter. Is the leftover milk good for that lemon juice, fresh cheese or anything? Yogurt, maybe. Uh, the leftover milk is absolutely fantastic for making Parmigiano Reggiano or Parmesan for us uh, common folk. Um, that's exactly what they do. They skim it, semi-skimmed, and they use the skim milk for Parmesan. Uh, and that's what gives it its unique flavour. So there you go, Michael. You will be able to make some Parmesan like you won't believe. It'll be absolutely fantastic. Um but uh, David's come up with a suggestion around, um, oh, it must be my throat, one teaspoon of apple cider, one teaspoon of raw honey to make your favourite tea will help you with that nagging little throat issue. Thank you. I've actually got some of that in the cupboard, both of those ingredients. Uh, Memo We said, we just want to let you know that I enjoy your videos. Thanks for providing relaxing and entertaining educational entertainment. I hope you continue filming for a long time. Well, there's no... Um, I'm not thinking of stopping anytime soon. Uh, not like Marzia, so I'm not stopping my YouTube career. Uh, I didn't get to 7 million yet, but uh, subscribers, that is. Anyway, um, Spart Mexico says, do you know what type of cheese baby bells are? The original ones were in the, they were like uh, Gouda. Uh, that was the style of cheese they were made in. Uh, they're branching out. They've got a few... Now, I think they've got a Swiss version. Uh, they've got a cheddar version. But, yeah, they are they are proper cheeses that are actually pressed in and very special presses to make the little baby cheeses. They mature very quickly because they're so small. So um, that's they mass produce them anyway. Uh, Trevor says, are the kits the best way to go or would it be better to piece out a kit individually? Not concerned about the price but rather getting all the equipment that will last the longest. Um, I know the kits we supply uh, have most of the utensils that you'll need, uh, including the basket, thermometer, cheesecloth, the starter cultures, all that sort of stuff. You'll just have to provide something as rudimentary as a pot um, and a stirring spoon and what else? And a curd knife. That's about it. Most of those things you should have in your room, in your kitchen, not your room, <laughs> in your kitchen. So you should be able to get away with that. Um, but, uh, yeah, look, you could do that. Although we do have an equipment pack, which is out of stock at the moment because I'm waiting for some cheese boards to come in. But uh, kits are definitely the way to go. They'll have most of the stuff in them that you'll need. Um, and you can get the rest of the stuff in the kitchen, usually. Okay. Let's uh, find where I left off. Jordy, welcome back. Um, hi, made it this week. I've been making Gouda, but haven't waxed or vacuum packed it. I'm looking at this, looking after it the same as my Gruyere. Is that okay? Do you think it's okay? If you do, continue what you're doing. Um, yeah, look, you can. No problems at all. Um, traditionally, Gouda has just a, uh, it's normally waxed anyway. So it has a very clean rind. Um, but if you want to age it, uh, like an old Amsterdam, then, uh, yeah, that's the best way to age it is naturally. Uh, you may down the track if the mould gets away from you. The, I mean, you can't clean it off fast enough. Then then maybe think about waxing or vacuum packing after you've cleaned the most, most of the mould you can off. Okay. Um... Jeffrey says, is your cheese cave, you keep saying your cheese at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 13 Celsius. Uh, what about cheeses that require a different uh, ripening temperature? It must be some long-term planning. Um, how far in advance do you start to plan? Uh, I don't really plan like that. <laughs> I'm uh, In my cheese fridge, there are three basic zones of temperature so it's one of those dorm fridges you know the uh, bar fridge we call them bar fridges here in australia and it's got a free little freezer section at the front that i've ripped the door off um and in that section there with my external thermostat connected 
it stays at about 7 degrees Celsius, which is perfect for bloomy white cheeses and some other cheeses that need a cold temperature. Then in the middle of the cheese, cheese fridge, the middle two shelves, perfect at 13 degrees, and it stays that all the time. Down the bottom, where you think it will be colder, it's not. It's actually warmer. It's usually about between 14 and 16 degrees Celsius. So any cheeses that need to be matured a little bit warmer, I put them down the bottom. So uh, I've mapped out the temperatures in my cheese fridge, and that's exactly what I use it for. I don't need to plan ahead. I just not make, need to make sure that I've got space on the shelves that I need to put the right cheeses in, if that makes sense. So that's what I do. So check with it when you get your own cheese fridge. Um, either use one of those laser thermometers, the um, you know probeless ones, that you, when you point and click, shoot, um, and check out the different zones of temperature within your own fridge. All fridges will have them. Um, there you go. All right, I hope that answers your question, Jeffrey. Uh, Spartan says, do you have a soap-making class like the Curd Nerd Academy? We will very soon. Um, in fact, lots of our classes will be going up online. Um, anything that we taught face-to-face, -face, like cold process soap making, melt and pour soap making, how to make bath bombs, um, how to make candles, that sort of thing, they're all going to be online courses, all very similar to the Curd Nerd Academy. It's not just a cheese courses website. I actually have been thinking of doing an advanced or a, a, a intermediate course, but I'm in the planning stages of that. I haven't really thought of what I'm going to put into it. Okay, uh, Wayne Dwayne says, uh, where do you think cheese histor historically originated from historically? Well, I have read a really good book. Um, I'll just see if I can find it. Book recommendation time. Here we go. Cheese and Culture by Paul S. Uh, Kinstead. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Anyway, this is all about the history of cheese. If you want to, from what they've gathered, I'm a modern archaeologist these days have figured out where cheese comes from. And the what they have determined is it was around the Fertile Crescent, stretching all the way down to ancient Egypt. So the Egyptians and the cultures that first lived in the Fertile Crescent um, obviously discovered that milk sours, and when you strain it, um, that you get curds and whey, and if you press the curds, you get cheese, which is amazing. So that's where it originated from. But great little book. I'll just show it again. Um, cheese and Culture. And the short title is A History of Cheese and It's Placed in Place in Western Civilization. There you go. Good little book. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Greeting. Oh, Lactobacillus Prime. Greetings from the Netherlands. Love the Leer Darm video. Thanks very much. A nice um, Dutch classic. Um, and mine's still sitting up on the shelf up there. It's got some development, eye development, but I'm going to let it ripen for another two weeks uh, because either of my uh, Propionic Shimani has gone bad um, or I just haven't left it long enough. Um, uh, Silver says rotted milk clumps. Yep, exactly what I said. How do you mature Munster in a cheese cove? Uh, Munster is matured in a ripening box so it doesn't contaminate other cheeses. Make sure it's well washed uh, at least twice a week and then you'll get the red-orange schmear all over it which is the Brevi bacterium linens, and uh, it ripens very, very well. And there is a video on it somewhere. Okay, Andrew says, um, did you get around to making Jutland blue? Uh, no, I have not. Um, let me just, I've got so many suggestions. These specific cheeses usually are just a style. So if there is a cream, say a creamy blue style, then I'll try and reproduce that. There are lots of Danish blues as well. Um, Costello Blue is the brand they sell here in Australia. I would say that's probably similar to Jutland Blue. Patricia says, when making whey ricotta last week with six litres of whey, 
Uh, just weigh, no added milk, and was surprised by the yield. I didn't weigh it, but there seemed to be lots. Yeah, look, it depends on how much fat was there originally in the milk, uh, how much whey proteins left, left over. The creamier the whey, the more uh, ricotta you're going to get. So that's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, where am I up to? I just lost myself. There we go. Uh, Aga says, so happy to make your petite blue Parmesan, uh, Manchego, Yarlsberg, smoked gouda so far, trying to make Danish Rijost. I think that's how you pronounce it. Today, if it passes a Danish taste test, I'll send you a fun recipe. Well, that would be really good. If you could, I would love to do that. Okay. Um, is there a bad cheese smell, says Rappler? Uh, well... If it smells like rotted meat, then yes, that is a bad cheese. Any other cheese smell, it's fair game as far as I'm concerned. Uh, look, by this stage of my uh, cheese growth wisdom, whatever you want to call it, right, I know what cheese is supposed to smell like when you add different bacteria to it. However, for a newbie, just make sure if it smells like rotten meat, throw it away. If the, no the nose knows, if it smells like smelly socks, that's okay, okay? Because that means you've got a brevi bacterium linens. If you intended to put that into your cheese, then fantastic. If you didn't, then you've just got an infection. You may want to run with it because it'll make a delicious cheese anyway. Okay, uh, me, Core Acres says, good evening, Gavin and Kim from sunny Florida. Um, welcome to the show. Uh, Lebna is how you pronounce it, says Dwayne. Yeah, I think so. Lebna or Labna, something like that. It's yogurt cheese. Very, very nice. There's a video on it somewhere too. Manal says, I have a problem with room temperature, 30 degrees to press. Do you have any solution to this problem? Um, well, during pressing, the cheese is supposed to be fairly warm anyway, and uh, it sounds like you're living in the tropics. Um and look, there's been 30 degree days here where I've made cheese and left it overnight. And uh, yeah, as long as it's only there for a day, then it should be okay. Uh, if you see oil um, or what looks like clear liquid, or not a clear liquid, it looks like an oily substance that starts coming out of the cheese, then you know the temperature's too high. Um, the only solution would be to take out one of the shelves in your cheese fridge and put the press and the, the, the mould, the basket, with the cheese in it in there and press it at 13 degrees Celsius. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, but normally, cheese is supposed to be fairly warm, around the same temperature as... Well, between room temperature... Let me get this right. Between room temperature and the initial starting temperature of the cheese, if you're pressing it, that's the temperature it should be because it helps it knit together as well, That uh, the warmth. Um you'll actually see a few uh, cheese recipes over on cheesemaking.com, the New England Cheese Making Supplier site. has lots of good recipes. And you'll see that Jim Wallace's recipes, some of those, do highly recommend that you keep the curd warm while it's being pressed. So you can um, don't worry too much. I don't think there is too much of a problem. But if you start seeing, like I said, an oily discharge from the cheese, then... Um, uh, see if you can get the temperature down in the cheese cove. Um, Arbitrary, Arbitrary, Arbitrary Alex says, Hi, Gavin, and chat. Um, question for you, Gavin. Uh, what are some good cheeses to start with making as a beginner cheesemaker? Third time round, yeah, okay. Um, here's one for you, halloumi. Everybody else has said, said it. Uh, try halloumi. You can um, check it out. Uh, Damien says, what cheese is best on crackers? Oh, all cheeses are good on crackers. Now, it depends. There's a lot of fancy cheeses, with a lot of fancy crackers with flavourings and all that. I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I'd rather go for your nice, plain water cracker. Sometimes there's peppered ones, water cracker biscuits. Um, but, yeah, just normal water cracker that doesn't detract from the taste of the cheese but actually adds a little bit of something to the to the cheese when you bite into it. So water crackers are my favourite. Josh says, thanks for doing what you do, Gavin. Much appreciated. No problems at all, Josh. Um, 
Uh, Saffron says, what is the most difficult cheese to make in your opinion? Uh, some people would say that quick mozzarella is difficult because they have trouble um, with the process and they give up halfway through when they're probably on the right track. Um, so for some people, quick mozzarella is a bit of a pain. Um, I found that pasta filata cheeses were a little bit difficult to make because you had to get the pH of the curd correct before you started adding the really hot water and starting to stretch it. That's the only problem with it. All the rest of the cheeses, as I've grown through my own cheese journey, you learn from one cheese and you and you fix those mistakes from your last cheese when you make the next cheese. So, yeah, so that's that's... There are no difficult ones. Maybe the pasta filata one's a little bit tricky, but then ask an Italian cheese maker, and they'll probably say they're easy, but uh, it's all subjective. Um, okay. Hal says, hello, hello, Hal. Uh, Kevin says, Arbitrin, Arbitrin, fresh cheese, easy to make. Yes, they are. Uh, Manal says, do we ship internationally? We do indeed. Um, we ship internationally to most countries except those that have been banned um, that are banned for stuff, international trade, have sanctions against them. Okay, um, got some more questions. Um, uh, Tom says, is it possible to combine blue and white mould? Indeed it is. Um, a classic case would be my uh, Bloomy Goat Blue. Uh, which was a nice, fresh lactic cheese, ash-coated. Um, I put some penicillium um, Roque 40 into that cheese as well as penicillium candidum. Um, and it grew a nice white coating over the ash and there was some blue flavour in the middle of the goat's cheese and that was really nice, yes. And there are other actual cheeses called Cambenzola, uh, which you may have heard of, which is a camembert with blue cheese in it, like gorgonzola. That's a mashup between camembert and gorgonzola. So camembert. Uh, if you can find a recipe for that somewhere, that'll be cool. Kim, I don't have that one, so don't go searching for it. Um, Dan says, do I prefer using tablet or liquid rennet? Depends on the cheese you're making. Um, for my standard um, quick mozzarella, I prefer to use tablet rennet because it's a known quantity. I know it works every time. Um, for all other cheeses, I prefer liquid rennet. It's just easier to measure, uh, and there's no guesswork. I know exactly how many millilitres of rennet to add. Um, Kevin has already answered my question. Very good. Um, right, okay. Where did I get up to? I just lost everything there. Um, Kim's answering my questions for me. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Um, Julie says, if you press your cheese too hard, long, what can happen to the cheese if you do everything else right? Uh, it'll just be more crumblier, uh, Julie, than uh, than the cheese recipe intended. So if you press it too hard, too long, uh, you're obviously squeezing out more moisture, more whey out of the cheese, more moisture. And instead of being uh, a smooth cut, when you cut it for tasting, it'll be crumbly. That's the, that's what will happen. Okay, trying to get down to a next question. Uh, Mexican says, a Spartan Mexican says, is it expensive to start making cheese? Oh, no more expensive than any other hobby, I suppose. Um, you do need a big pot. Um, and here in Australia, saying a steel pot like that will cost you about $30. I've got a three-gallon pot or three-and-a-half-gallon pot, and that seems to work for me. I can make a multitude of cheeses. In fact, I've got a – there's a video somewhere on the equipment that I use. Um, and uh, most kitchens will have most of the stuff you'll need anyway. I opt for stainless steel because it's easier to clean and you can actually see on it that it is clean and doesn't have any cheese stone or anything like that. And cheese stone is bits of dried up curd that go rock hard. They really do. And when you're trying to clean your pots again, make sure you clean your pots straight after you finish making cheese. 
But yeah, I don't think it's that expensive. Really, if you're really looking to get into it in a big way, then you could start off easy, $200. Um, that'll get you a cheese kit and a press and probably some utensils and maybe your pot as well. Um, that's $200 Australian. Um, but if you get your stuff from you know, like your stirring spoon and, and uh, measuring spoons and stuff like that, if you get those from the um, secondhand shop uh, or opportunity shop or thrift store, whatever they call it, uh, then, yeah, you'd, you'd have no problems at all. Okay, i got 10 minutes to go. We'll see how many questions I can get through. Uh, Jedi Fat says, My cheese cave has a glass door and interior light. light. Does the light affect mold growth? No, it doesn't. Um, it will still grow. I've definitely, I used to have a wine fridge like that that had a glass door on the front and a light. Um, I made sure the light turned off, basically. Should have a switch somewhere there um, because it just wastes more electricity. That's all. That's the only thing I can think of. But I made lots of cheeses successfully. So, um, Asama says, in addition to making cheese, can you give us a small history of its origin and how you serve it? I'll think of that. I'll have to use the book as reference. And cheese platter. No problems at all. There's two video suggestions. Thanks very much to Sama. Um, uh, Cora says, recipe for German quark. Yes, I do have one. Let's, I'll write that one down too. Gee, I'm going to be busy, aren't I? Uh, quark. There we go. Um, where are we up to? Uh, Ramiro says, greetings from Argentina. G'day, Ramiro. Uh, Dwayne says, Labna is awesome. I like it with herbs, garlic, lemons, juice, and lemon zest, salt and pepper in it. Yeah, that'd be really nice. Um, very similar to the, I think, the lemon-infused olive oil that we used when we sat down and ate it with the flatbread. It was really nice and some uh, ducker over the top. Stir that in. Fantastic. Danielle said, I made camembert recently. Mold is great. Temperature was very regulated in a wine fridge. But the cheese feels quite hard. Excuse me. <coughs> no, only two today. Okay. Uh, the cheese feels quite hard. Will it get softer? Um, what could have gone wrongish? No, nothing, I don't think. Um, uh, if you've got it wrapped now, if you've got the white mold all over, wrap it in cheese wrap which is a micro-perforated version of the silver wrap. Um, so, yeah, wrap it in the wrap and keep it in the normal kitchen fridge at 4 degrees Celsius, um, and you will find that it starts to go soft after about two, three weeks. Just test it by squeezing the cheese. That's all you have to do when it's in its paper. And then when it starts to feel a bit squishy, then it would be absolutely fine um, to give it a go. Um, Kevin says, um, Gavin, by the way, you once said in a video about lactose free videos, you add calcium because of the missed lactose. Actually, you have to add it in when it's pasteurized because of the calcium. Yes, that's correct, Kevin. Sorry, I might have, I say lots of things in my videos that probably aren't correct, but, uh, I do try and do it the best. Okay. Um, Alex says, um, hi, Gavin, any plans for Kasu Marzu? Not that I know of, and I don't want any maggots in my cheese. Um, Reef says, greetings, Gavin. Finally made the live stream. Thanks for all your great bids. I shall nibble the Bell Paese whilst I watch. It came out amazing. Wife loves it. Good on you, mate. Uh, Daniel says, love your channel from Denmark. Reef is from Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, David, my favourite mouldy cheese is Humboldt Fog. Um, it made in Humboldt, California, not as strong as blue cheese. I've heard of Humboldt Fog. In fact, I saw it on um, uh, Rhett and Link when they did their cheese tasting video, which was quite funny, actually. Um, Andrew says, why is charcoal added to some cheeses? Uh well, to the outside of the cheese, it actually prepares, it lowers the acid, sorry, it lowers the, sorry, it raises the pH. 
because ash is an alkaline and it prepares the surface of the cheese to grow white mold. That's why they put ash on the outside of some cheeses. Um, and the white mold goes crazy. It's great. Um, they sometimes add a layer of ash in the middle for more beer, but that's just more of a visual thing. It doesn't do anything to the cheese. It used to, they used to use um, one day's milk and then make the curds and then put a layer of ash there to protect it. And then they the next day curd, put it on top of that. But that was the only reason they used it. Uh, these days it's just used for um, decoration. Um, okay, uh, we've got five minutes to go. Kim's probably winding me up by now if I go all the way to the bottom. Uh, yes, she is. Um, so sorry, everybody. I know there's some questions left. Um, I didn't quite get through them all today. But thanks again for watching uh, the Arts of Cheese Man. Appreciate everybody turning up. We had many, many people on the chat today, which is absolutely fantastic. More than I can keep up, keep up with. Um, <clears throat> so um, don't forget, you can pop over to our online store if you want to make any cheeses. Great kits over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Um, if you want to support us via Patreon, then uh, please do so. Pop over to patreon.com slash grinning at Gavin. I know it's an old link, but it's the one that works. And or YouTube memberships, which you can join at the bottom of the video after it's gone into uh, archive mode. Um, also, don't forget that you can get some cool merch. I don't have... Oh, yes, I do. I've got some cool merch. Um, there is a... Will be a link down the bottom. In fact, Kim's already done it. Fantastic. Well done, honey. Uh, teespring slash store slash cheeseman.tv. And that's where you can get your cool merch. Uh, T-shirts. I've got about eight designs now. Uh, and you can get mugs, iPhone covers, stickers, uh, what else? Oh, hoodies, you name it, with all your favourite cheese stuff on it. In fact, there's even some illustrations by Kim that were taken from my cheese book, Keep Calm and Make Cheese. Anyway, I think that's about all we got time for. Kim's given me the big wind-up. Um, so uh, thank you for watching, everybody. Without your questions, there would be no show every week. I do appreciate you turning up week on week um, and dropping by to say g'day to me, the cheese man. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just uh, makes this old bloke's heart um, uh, flutter with joy. Anyway, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I will see you next time. Thank you, Paul, for the super chat before I head off. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, g'day, Curd Nerds. G'day, Curd Nerds. Well, g'day, Curd Nerds. We'll get a curd nerds. We'll get a curd nerds. We'll get a curd nerds.